Thanksgiving for the life of Kenneth Alfred Strudwell. Alan Moore is my name. Just a couple of housekeeping things. The toilets are either in the end of the hall, down the far end of the hall, or else underneath where I'm standing here. You can get to those side entrance here and downstairs. The order of service has been handed out to you. If you'd like to turn to the second page, inside there. Generally speaking, the piece is in darker type and the bits of you respond with. Grace and peace from the Lord be with you. And also with you. We've come together to thank God for the life of Ken Strutt, to mourn and honour him, to lay to rest his mortal body, and to support one another in grief. We face the certainty of our own death and judgment. Yet Christians believe that those who die in Christ share eternal life with him. Therefore, in faith and hope, we turn to God who created and sustains us. Sing together these words, comfort, comfort all my people, taken from Isaiah chapter 40.
Most people would say that Dad lived a long life, but it wasn't long enough for Dad. A few weeks ago, he told me he wasn't ready to die because as long as he was able to see his children and his grandchildren, life was worth living. Dad had so many near misses throughout his life that it was nothing short of a miracle that he made it to 86. There were close calls in childhood with near drownings and swollen rivers, pneumonia after jumping off the Brighton Pier. While sitting his final exams and senior, he woke up in pain, took some castor oil, didn't tell his mother and went off to do the exam. The first the family knew was when Ken was in emergency at the Brisbane Hospital with a ruptured appendix. His two sisters slept in their brother's ute outside the hospital overnight while the parents kept a bedside vigil. Nan would later tell us that she truly believed he would die that night. Four years later, he was working in Charleville, driving home after playing at a party out on a cattle station. The um, ute hit a, um, had a, hit a cattle grate. He was driving with one of the band members. Dad went through the windscreen and lay unconscious in a ditch overnight. In the morning, or when he woke up, he dragged himself to a nearby cattle property. I'm not sure how near it was, probably not that close. Dragged himself to the property, and they put them in the back of the ute and drove them to the nearest hospital, which was about 60 miles away. Many, many years later, Dad could still remember every bump on that journey. The nurses thought Dad was okay, but an ambulance driver that he'd met through playing jazz took one look at him and said he was taking him down to the next town, which again was a long way. By chance, a talented surgeon happened to be visiting. He recognised immediately that Dad was in serious trouble and operated, removing his ruptured spleen. Many years later, Dad clipped an obituary from the paper saying simply, that man saved my life. Ken largely managed to stay out of danger for many years until age got the better of him. At 80, he had drained his pool to clean it, we don't know why. Some muddy water had attracted a little green frog. Being the middle of January, Dad was worried that the little frog would boil and die. So he climbed in to rescue it, slipped and fell, breaking his shoulder. It took him two hours or more, in well over 30 degree heat, to drag himself out of the pool but he still had a shower and tidied himself up before he rang his for help. Two years ago, for no good reason, he went out to move the lawnmower. It was beyond mowing the lawn, so why he was moving it, we don't know. But he fell over and he broke his hip. His duress alarm didn't work because he had left the phone off the hook. So he lay there on an ant nest for a couple of hours until his neighbours heard him call. The hip surgery was successful, but serious post-operative delirium looked like it would be the end of him. Again, he pulled through, less mobile, and unable to return to live at home, but alive and happily so. For the last year, he lived at a cedar lodge, and we are extremely grateful for the wonderful care he received there. Two months ago, an undiagnosed episode of pneumonia saw him nearly call it a day on the x-ray table at Marta Private. And while that may have been a fitting end for a radiographer, we are eternally grateful to the life-saving work of Dr. Steve Pistola my husband Robert, Josh Crockett and the exceptional team at Queensland X-Ray. Surviving that incident gave the dad and his four children some wonderful time sitting around his hospital bed in the penthouse at the Marta. Of course, dad didn't do much talking, but he was as happy as ever listening to our stories and Ashley's jokes. Despite all odds, dad left hospital and went back to the home. A few weeks later, saw a return to Greenslopes Hospital and a battle that he couldn't win. We did, however, wonder if we should put a little bell in the coffin just in case. <laughs> Dad had many wonderful doctors caring for him throughout his long period of ill health. He liked to tell us that he had the top man looking after him, that this referred to any and all of his specialists. But we would particularly like to thank Dr. Andrew Boffinger, Dr. Tony Mills, and Dr. Sue Kehoe for their kind and compassionate care over many years. More than at home with the slide projector, so here we go. Ken was born on the 2nd of September, 1931 in Mackay, where his father, Robert, was working as a chemist in the sugar mills. His mother, Jane, was equally bright and had also studied as a sugar chemist, the first female in Queensland to do so. But she had to quit upon marriage, as were the social norms of the times. 
Within a few years, Ken had moved with his family to Namble. While working at the sugar mill there, Ken's father invented the Strumpel Wheel, a device which enabled the chemical testing of the purity of the sugar cane. The patent and subsequent sale of the wheel around the world enabled the family to build a house in Nanwell. These were happy times for the family with an older brother, Bob, and two younger sisters, Faye and Anne, enjoying camping holidays at Marichidor and a typical country childhood. The start of World War II saw Ken's father take up a position as munitions manager in Melbourne, manufacturing bombs later transferring to another factory in Sydney. At the end of the war, the family returned to Nanwell. Ken's father probably hoped to get his old job back, but it wasn't to be. The family house was sold, and they lived on a little cottage on a farm just outside Lockwood. Ken and his brother Bob attended Nanwell State High, cycling down and back up the range every day. Unable to find work, the family moved to Brisbane, where Ken and Bob built a house with their father at Hemant, digging a 200-yard trench to bring electricity out to the property. The boys attended Brisbane State High, just across the road, and despite the disruption to their schooling years, excelled academically. Ken's father was a difficult man, and life was not always easy. However, together they built crystal sets and made musical instruments, and they meticulously planned and designed gardens and sand, um, castles for their sand garden competitions, which they often won. Ken adored his mother, and she always told us how kind he was to her throughout her whole life. Both Ken's sisters moved to England in the 1960s, and after their father's early death, their mother joined them there. Despite the distance, Ken remained close and he was happy to speak with his only surviving sibling, Faye, in London, just before he died. Faye loved staying with Dad on her trips back to Australia. We know Faye is sad to be so far away from us at this time, but she helped us write the eulogy, and she chose him for the funeral service, and she's very much with us today. After leaving school, Ken left home and commenced a pharmacy apprenticeship in Charlotte. About two years in, the pharmacist died, and the pharmacy board told Dad he would have to start from the beginning with a new pharmacist. Instead, he returned to Brisbane and started a career in radiography at the Brisbane Hospital. He moved to what is now the Princess Alexandra Hospital when it opened in 1957. This was the start of a long and successful career, but more importantly, it was here that Ken met Elaine Fraser, a vivacious and beautiful medical type, the typist originally from Gladstone. They were married in 1960 and moved into a new estate in Merstead Street, Camp Hill. Here they would bring up four wonderful children, <laughs> two little brother, Wendy and Ashley, in a happy home. They were wonderful family holidays to Elaine's family in Gladstone. Ken was very close to all Elaine's family. And our holidays were always full of parties and excursions with all the cousins to the family farm at Tuggini and fishing at the Calliope and Boy Rivers or on Uncle Dudley's boat. Ken was particularly close to his mother's family in Mackay. His aunts and uncles, Jim and Jess, Mary and Fred, Gilly and Leela and their families. They shared his love of music and family holidays in Mackay, always featured parties with playing the guitar. Uncle Jim and Auntie Jess on the mouth organ. Cousin Bobby on the accordion and everyone was singing. We also went on many great excursions and holidays in the big orange comedy band touring Australia. Ken and Elaine worked tirelessly on the family home, doing major excavations, building extensions and putting in a pool. This was a great love of Dad's and he continued to work on the house into his 80s, much to the horror of his children and his neighbours. Only a couple of years ago, his neighbour Aaron rousted him for hanging off a ladder off the side of the house. He was fixing a gutter, and then he found a snake in the gutter that he thought the kids would like to look at. So he tried to catch it, and then he lost his footing. It's probably one more than the first that I just put it in. <laughs> Music was a lifelong joy for Ken. His family were very musical, and he learned to play violin from a young age. He could play many instruments, but somewhere in his teens he took up saxophone. In his twenties, a band needed a double bass player, 
So he found a poor cracked apology for a double bass, glued it up, repaired it, and taught himself to play. Ken played professionally throughout his life, in jazz bands, at weddings and parties, and at regular jobs in, uh, at the Majestic and National Hotels and others. He had many a story to tell of the nightlife of the Bianca Peterson era. Watching from the stage as money would be delivered in brown paper bags to well-known identities and policemen. One night he even watched a rival gang member throw another out the first floor, first floor window of the National Hotel as the band played on and the police weren't called. It would all be revealed later in the Fitzgerald Inquiry that Dad had seen it all from the stage. For many years he was part of the Big River Jazz Band and forged lifelong friendships with his friends. Elaine and Ken were a good match. Ken liked to play music. Elaine loved people and loved to dance. We had wonderful parties with no end of jazz musicians ready to provide the entertainment. <laughs> when mum wanted everyone to go home, the kids would start performing. It still works today. Ken and Elaine had a mutual determination to provide their children with a state of home, a good education, and most importantly, a music education. We all learned piano and one other instrument, whether we wanted to or not. Sadly, Elaine died far too soon in 1989 without seeing any of her grandchildren born and music would be a great solace to Ken throughout the following years. A few months after Elaine's death, Ken was promoted to Chief Radiographer at the PA Hospital, where he worked until his retirement in 1995. In 37 years at PA, he had been a Senior Radiographer for 15 years, Assistant Chief for six, and Chief for six. He had introduced the first mobile image, image intensifier X-ray unit in Queensland, and was one of the two radio workers who introduced CT into Queensland hospitals. Ken was a lifelong advocate of radio workers, holding positions of radiation protection officer, workplace safety officer and industrial advocate. He was instrumental in facilitating the change of the radio workers industrial award to the professional and technical scale, which was a major advance in the professional status of radio workers in Queensland. Ken was highly regarded in his profession. He was a mentor and teacher, a great mentor and teacher, and I received many messages from radiographers and radiologists who fondly remember being taught by him, as I do. Over 20 years, over the 20 years since his retirement, Ken enjoyed the company of many of his colleagues at the old cronies get-togethers organised by Perina Altidon. We give our heartfelt thanks to Perina and the boys for keeping in touch with Dad. It meant a great deal to him. Many years ago, Ken was fortunate to find a wonderful companion and partner in Ida Garner. Ida was a jazz singer and shared his great passion and knowledge of jazz. They spent many happy years together, enjoying the company of Ken's family and grandchildren and Ida's family, in particular her sister Jean and brother Owen, his wife Carolyn and their families. Ida was full of life and love and it was wonderful that they found happiness together in their later lives until Ida's death in 2004. Without doubt, Dad's greatest joy came from his family and especially watching his 12 grandchildren and one great-granddaughter grow up. That's a little word. He was a kind, generous and humble man and he will be sad the rest. Just having a laugh about the technology and when you had such a lovely job done with the photos and the PowerPoint and the thing and printed out, and typed up on the iPad and I used my daughter's feedback for you. Nothing in order to find. So just pause me as I go, but I couldn't uh, yeah, yeah, if you like. I wasn't going to say anything, but I was sitting the other day and we were talking about the order of service and I was, Alan asked us what names Dad was known by and Kenneth Alfred struggling and Ken and whatever and I felt poorly at the time because I didn't know if Big Ken, 
And anyone who didn't know Big Ken in sort of the neighbourhood and amongst all my friends hadn't been around because everyone knew Big Ken, everyone loved Big Ken. And we were sitting at the little ship's pub at Strabroke Island one afternoon playing one of the many gigs and he was good though, he always invited himself and let my mates know if he was ever playing and we went to plenty. And uh, we were in the sun and on the grog and having a great afternoon and I'll never forget the announcer thanking the band again. And on double bass, Big Kenny Strugnall and the crowd cheered and we cheered and from that moment on he was Big Kenny. And he was very good my friends and as my sister would know some of my mates are pretty loose and he, he was pretty good with how he handled a lot of what went on in those days. Might be a comfort to you, he slept through most but he was a good sleeper. A couple of bottles of tonic most afternoons and off to bed in the evenings. But I had even things written down, things I was going to say, but I'll just probably reiterate the one you just said. He had great loves in his life. He loved his family, loved his music. I, I always felt as though, you know, I, you know, you know, he bought trumpets and piano lessons and all the rest of it. And I know he really would love me to have um, uh, probably done a bit more. Just struggling a little bit, sorry. Uh, I set up the storms. But I will say one thing, he was, he was solid in his love. I remember the one thing he came to, and I got picked as the third trumpet in the grade 10 intermediate band, which effectively meant I hit eight notes in five minutes. And three of them were different. And he sat, my mother sat there through two hours of that. And we're all parents, we know, it's, it's just, Screech most of it, and you go, oh, it's very good and encouraging. He sat through two hours to give me get eight notes, and he was just rapping about it. Seen his son perform music, and I could never get over that. And the other thing that I ever wanted to come along was to surf ice saving, and for 15 years, and carnivals, and all the competition, and whatever, he never came to the thing, right? It just wasn't his, his thing. But one thing he does come to was a Bucks party. Uh, what I was thinking, but anyway, I invited him to a Bucks party, and it was all good because it was official at the start, but it was a good night. We had dinner, and Mum and Dad came along, and it was so good there, and Dad seized upon an opportunity to have a father-son meeting with me that he'd never had with me. The girls know the one I did have with me. <laughs> that came from my mother, and she just handed me a book on what happens. And, uh, But um, no, look, he came to the surf club deal, I, I won't ramble on, but he came along and he seized his moment to come over and he said, son, I've been a musician for many years and I've been to lots of gigs. And he said, so I've seen it enough. And he said, but I want to talk about there's a lady standing over there at the bar and I want to alert you to this type of woman. <laughs> they're, they're not here for <laughs> anything but probably a bit of entertainment. I said, Dad, Dad, look, that's... She couldn't tell that anything. No, no, no. I said, look at how she's dressed. And she's looking around with a certain look in her eye. And he's trying to play it up and give me all the alerts to look out for. And I said, Dad, it's the president's daughter. She's a lesbian. <laughs> and in typical Big Ken style, he just said, well, that's a possibility. <laughs> he's never wrong. And his other love was his mother. He did love his mother very much. And when the two worlds collided at my 21st birthday, when I had half the surf up and my grandmother walking around, it's another great big Ken moment that a lot of my mates remember. But the boys had all chipped in to buy me a surfboard for my birthday. And everybody that chipped in got to sign and write a little note on a little cardboard cut up surfboard that made for a card and gave me. It was one form. We had the presentation board got put away and all the rest of it. And I was sitting out there having a beer and I'll never forget Dad running out and just in his very calm way he just pulled me aside and he said, look, you need to get in there and sort out that bloody ridiculous car. Your grandmother is reading the message from Dave the Slade. <laughs> <laughs> so I hadn't read any of this car myself as yet. So I sorted that out with me in the morning with vague explanations of what Dave was getting at, but it was just a wonderful time, and we did. It was great family times, and I'll
covenant, when this covenant nice in the PowerPoint, we did enjoy ourselves and we had a good life. The one stir I did get, and Dad did cop plenty for me, and he was always up for him. I was always doing things and moving stuff and just to annoy him, just to have a bit of fun, you know how it is, you know, put the lawnmower somewhere different when he was about to mow and 15 minutes looking for it and give up on mowing and just little things. But the last pleasure I did have with him was with the girls and I don't know, you probably see some photos there and, and Dad was always a very proper, very stylish man. He was a style master. He might have worn, you know, his dad and target grey polyesters around home and that, but when he was out he was always looking sharp. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> but look, we all know what his hair, his hair was like. And if you have a look at the, the service thing, his hair was always immaculate. And his hair sort of went in the last few days. And we'd drop around to see him in the hose. And that day he had the meanest mobile going. It was just, you could see other people at home thinking about it, thinking, I'll be better go, I reckon. It was all right. I don't know if we had that other photo there. And then we showed up another day, Arnie and I. And we had Liberace. <laughs> and it was just for a man who I could never remember a hair out of place. Every time I was just blown away. Like, how did that hair do? <laughs> it was just, but it was just good fun right to the very end. But I think I've said enough. And I just wanted everyone to know that there, there, he was good value for all this very professional and, and, and very staunch way about him. You had heaps of fun with him. Yeah, that Lawrence one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll show you that because that was after my uncle Bob's funeral, which was uh, yeah, a big one for the family. But anyway, we went out after the uh, funeral, and uh, typical dad so I said, "We better hook in East Karina and have a couple of beers." Eh? Yeah. He said, yeah, "All right, no worries." So we hooked in there, and we're having a couple of beers, and. I flipped down and just, you're just so used to your own world, not even thinking. I've ripped the phone out, I've got the phone down. And he's looking at me and he's going, What are you doing? I'm going, I'm taking a photo. He's going, Why are you taking a photo of the floor? <laughs> I'm going, It's us. And I'm looking at the screen. He's like, You know, like I'm holding some great magic and I'm about to conquer an entire island nation with my Lord of this. And he's looking at it and I'm going, No, you're turning around. So now we're looking at now we're looking at us. He's going, so why are you doing that for? I'm going, it's a selfie, Dad. You know, like, so that is my father's first selfie. <laughs> and he's still trying to work out the powerful magic I've had going that I could be actually looking at us and taking our photo at the same time. But we had a lot of fun, it's good. So I'll just part with Anyone who knew the struggles, and we were almost like the Partridge family when we were on tour, this orange combi and the chocolate block, it had dogs in it, bases in it, everything. On the, dad, on the morning Dad passed away, a mate of mine rang me about an hour later and said, just on the way down, but <laughs> they, they called me up. So, uh, Sorry, I was doing my best, but uh, we, we picked the combi up, we took it home, and um, we've sort of, um, I haven't put it the sisters yet, but I'm thinking about sprinkling the ashes around inside. And, uh, <laughs> we'll see, but well, thank you for your patience, but I just want to say thank you. I'm flattered by the Nurse Street boys that have come along, family have come together, and uh, I'm sad that a piece of our life um, is leaving. But be happy. Our dad wasn't one to make a fuss, so he would have been embarrassed by our words here today and probably a lot of what we said. So. <laughs> dad was a kind and gentle soul. Having a quiet cup of tea or a beer in our company on his front veranda was one of his favourite things. He especially loved the birds that nested in the trees out the front. He knew them, including the two parents who perched quietly either side of their chick throughout the night as a wild storm blew. The doves that came to be fed in the courtyard out the back, and the peewee that followed the mother. He also loved to tinker and fix things. Recently we came across a light 
that had been made from odd parts lying around. It had a fan base, it had uh, a switch that he'd got from the wall, and it had this light and a nice little um, crafted top on it to keep the dust or the weather off. It was a work of wonder, of craftsmanship. As William McGuinness would say, a man's got to have a hobby. Dad's moving to a Cedar Lodge made a profit downturn for Bunnings, Cannon Hill, no doubt. <laughs> Reading the Korean Mile was another habit of Dad's. He took everything printed as fact and cut out particularly important articles to lecture us about. Ashley's just found a clipping about roof repairs, so Dad's spirit lives on. His other concern was the music education of his grandchildren. If only one of them had played the trumpet. He did derive great joy from his grandchildren though and loved hearing their news. All of these things will make us smile, but other memories will be deeper. Dad welcomed into the family each of our life partners, Sean, Michael, Rob and Madonna, with pride that we had each chosen so well. Dad looked for the good in others and never spoke ill of people. And I was telling him about a cedar because we had to find a nursing home for him while he was in hospital. He said, well, if you wanted to look for faults, you'd be sure to find them. This intention to look for the good in life was a trait of Dad's and one we will all cherish. It would be a fitting tribute to Dad if each of us here today could take a little of his generosity of spirit and build it into our own lives. service on the fifth page in, you'll find Psalm 23. A psalm that is often read at this time, mainly because of the first line in the second paragraph, even though I walk to the darkest valley, I fear no evil. So as we say this psalm together, we're rehearsing an ancient document which speaks of the Lord's comfort and presence of his people throughout life and death. You join me in saying this together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come in. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. I have these two readings in the Bible now. Those who read them, come forward. reading is from Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, 
and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Jesus said, Do not let the hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that to go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You heard the family speak with Ken, the quiet man, the one who loved to listen to others, who had no ears or graces, prepared to speak to anyone. Very kind, generous, respectful person. Give thanks to God for this intelligent, gentlemanly man. Give thanks to God for all the memories you have of him times you've shared together. The other thing I want to encourage you to do today, though, is to thank God for the way in which he understands our situation, our condition, our doubts. If you read carefully through those particular readings you've just had, particularly the one from Ecclesiastes, the writer of it recognises what can only be described as the vanity and futility of life in many respects, the repetition of it. And yet he recognises that God has a much greater plan that we find hard to understand at times. When Jesus spoke to his disciples about his promise to prepare a place for them and to take them to himself, they also were confused. They found it difficult. And Thomas expressed that confusion, that question. We do not know where you are going, Lord. How can we know the way? Many of you will have questions about life in general, about death in particular, if you think carefully about it. I believe the Christian message has a great message of hope for us, and that Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the means by which he is able to say to Thomas, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. This may not be a popular message today. It may not be one that is easily understood. But I still think it's the best message for all of us at a time like this. When we are confronted by the shortness of life, 80 plus years is still short in many respects, life could still have gone on for Ken. He had much more to live for. And yet it comes to an end, unexpectedly, sadly. Can I encourage you to turn to Jesus, to look at him as the way, the truth and the life, the one who provides for us all that we need throughout life, but particularly as we face the end of life and have to say farewell to a loved one as we are today in him. The next hymn that we're about to sing is a prayer in many respects. And you may like to sing it as that prayer, particularly the first verse. So if you understand now and join us to sing together, the Father, Lord of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Thank you. 
pray with confidence to God our Father, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead for the salvation of all. Thanks be to God for the gift of life. You have made us in your image and called us to reflect your truth and light. We thank you for the life of Ken Strutter. Above all, we thank you for your gracious promise to all your servants, living and departed, that we shall be made one again in our Lord Jesus Christ. Today we particularly pray, Lord, that as the Father of all mercies and the giver of all comfort, that you would deal graciously with all those who mourn Ken's death, that casting all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Grant us all, Lord, wisdom and grace to use and right the time that's left to us here on earth. While we have time, lead us to repent of our sins and to do what we have left undone. Strengthen us to follow in the steps of your Son, Jesus Christ, along the way of your eternal kingdom. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You join me in praying the Lord's Prayer together as our Saviour Christ has taught us and are confident to use these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom of power and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave new birth to our brother Ken by water and the Spirit. Grant that his death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way, to live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. Let us trust Ken to the mercy of God. Join me in praying together. Holy and loving Father, by your mighty power you gave us life, and in your love you have given us new life in Christ Jesus. We entrust Ken to your merciful keeping, in the faith of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to save us, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in glory and heaven. Amen. Will you stand with me? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. In your keeping are all who have parted in Christ. We here commit the body of Ken to be cremated, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again for us, and who shall change our mortal body that it may be like his glorious body. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people in Israel. Seeing it's a bit cold outside, we might just say the blessing and dismiss all here before the casket is taken out. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.